Wonderful. We will be recording this session and it will be posted after on the Museum at Home webpage. During today's session, we would love to hear your questions and we want you to pop them in the comment box. We'll do our best to answer as many as possible at the end. All right, are you ready? Grab your po tie, slather on some sunscreen, and let's begin our journey. We are starting here in Aotearoa, but we have a fair way to travel. We are going back 5,000 years into the past. So, hop on your camel and come with us as we cross the world to the northeastern corner of the continent of Africa to ancient Egypt. And here we are. We are going to head back in time. Well, we have already 5,000 years into the past. This is ancient Egypt. As you look around, you can see the Sahara Desert spreading out in every direction. There are huge sweeping sand dunes far off in the distance, camels traversing over the crests of those golden colored hills and pyramids and temples dot the landscape. There are flies whew, and mosquitoes buzzing around and we are sweating under this blistering hot sun. This really is a sight to behold. And it is here where we begin our exploration of this amazing civilization. How do you think we can learn about ancient Egypt? First, we can look at what has been left behind. There are many buildings and monuments that still stand today. The pyramids, for example, and we can see them right here. There are also artifacts and objects such as statues, jewelry, and even mummies. But we also know a lot about these people because of their writing. Now, their writing is not quite like how we would write today. Instead, they used pictures. Each image represented an idea or a word. These were called hieroglyphs. Here's an example. This here is their writing. Actually, to an ancient Egyptian, this is probably a paragraph. You might be able to see some figures that you recognize. If you look closely, see if you can spot any birds or how about an eye? There's even a snake somewhere in this image. Each one of these pictures stands for or represents something. Now, we are going to give you a challenge to see if you can translate some hieroglyphs. At the top here, we have the alphabet, and you'll notice that each letter has a symbol above it. For example, the letter M is represented by an owl, and the letter D is represented by a hand. Using this as your guide, try to figure out what this says below. Now we are going to give you 30 seconds. Here we go. So just to let you know, there are in fact two words here. They're not English words, but we do use this phrase quite often in Aotearoa. And keep in mind that it is also Te Wiki o Te Reo Māori Language Week. Hmm, what could it be? A few more seconds. Almost. All right, you think you got it? Let's reveal what the hieroglyphs say. Kia ora. If you got that, hare mai te toki. Well done. If you're interested in trying to write your name in hieroglyphs or write some secret messages, we will post the link to an online resource on our website after the show. So now that we have you thinking like in an ancient Egyptian, let's have a look at what daily life was like for them. You may be wondering how people survived in such a hot and dry environment. Remember, we are in the middle of a desert. The ancient Egyptians thrived in this location. In fact, the entire civilization lasted more than 3,000 years. That's a thousand years before the year zero. 
Many historians think that ancient Egypt became so successful largely because of the River Nile. This here is the River Nile, and it runs through Egypt. The Nile is the second longest river in the world. It's almost 7,000 kilometers long. That's the same distance between Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, and Hawaii. It travels through 11 countries and is teeming with wildlife like turtles, crocodiles, and hippopotamuses. For the ancient Egyptians, the Nile was very important. They would use the land around the river to grow food, and they would also travel along the Nile by boat, even though it was full of crocodiles. The civilization thrived, and soon we had powerful people taking control. Drum roll, please. Let us introduce you to uh, the pharaohs. Pharaohs were the kings of ancient Egypt. They were in charge of everything making the laws, overseeing the army, and leading religious ceremonies. In fact, they were thought to be the gods on earth. King Tutankhamun is probably the best known pharaoh today because his tomb was discovered intact. He has been nicknamed the boy king because he was only eight years old when he became pharaoh. Can you imagine having that kind of power at your age? Whew. It is thought that he was 18 years old when he died, but we don't really know how this happened. One theory, though, is that he was attacked by a hippopotamus. Pharaohs had ultimate power and often made some very crazy demands. For example, one pharaoh had a honey slave in every room. They were covered in sticky honey to attract the flies and stop them from buzzing around the pharaoh. Pharaohs also had servants who would not only dress and bathe them, but one servant's job was specifically to wipe the royal bottom. During the entire span of the civilization, there were about 170 pharaohs that ruled all over ancient Egypt. Most pharaohs were men, but sometimes women became rulers and were called pharaoh as well. Hatshepsut was a female pharaoh. She wanted to be seen as being just as powerful as a man. She wore a full face of makeup, which in Egypt was normally for men. To make herself more kingly, many of her statues show her with bulging muscles and like any respectable pharaoh, a fake full chin beard. So pharaohs were a pretty big deal. With great power comes great responsibility, after all. And like anyone who has power, they want to be remembered for all eternity. So they ordered the construction of statues and giant gravestones to be built throughout Egypt. Enter the pyramids. These are the pyramids of Giza, and they are not the only pyramids in Egypt. How many pyramids do you think have been found in Egypt. Let's play a little guessing game. So, do you think there's one, three, perhaps 56, or 140? I'll give you a moment to think. How many pyramids? All right, would you like to know? 140. If you got that, give yourself a pocky pocky. There are at least 140 different pyramids in this part of the world. There may be even more out there buried under the sands of the Sahara. The ancient Egyptians used to bury pharaohs in these large tombs, along with their most prized possessions. They believed that people would need these objects in the afterlife. And for the pharaohs, they needed to enter the afterlife filled with all of the things that they would need in the next world. All of the Egyptian pyramids were actually built along one side of the Nile. That way, when the sun set, the, white, the light would glow from behind them. On average, it took 20 years to build a pyramid, and some of them even had toilets. The most famous pyramid of all is the Great Pyramid of Giza, 
You can see it here, actually, in this photo. It's the tallest one in the middle. And speaking of being the tallest, it is one of the most well-known giant monuments of the ancient world. And when it was completed, as I said, it was the tallest thing ever built. It held this title for thousands of years. So speaking of it being the tallest thing ever built for over a thousand years, how tall do you think the Great Pyramid of Giza is in meters? Again, another guessing game. 26 meters, 74 meters, would it be 100 meters or 138 meters? Hmm. Well, the correct answer is 138 meters. Whoa! really, really quite tall. Now, let's compare it to something perhaps that we would recognize. That's right. Even if we stacked five Auckland museums on top of one another, the Great Pyramid of Giza would still be taller. Whew. The Sphinx is another iconic structure that was built by the ancient Egyptians. The Great Sphinx of Giza is believed to have been built more than four and a half thousand years ago, and pharaohs would put their face on it. Hmm. There are others who think the Great Sphinx of Giza is much older, so there is a bit of a mystery surrounding it. Speaking of mystery, have you noticed that there's something missing on the face of the Sphinx? Have a closer look. Where is its nose? To this day, we are not sure what happened to it, how it fell off, or where it went. There are many theories, but nobody knows for sure. We do think that maybe the Sphinx was built to impress the gods. Louisa is going to tell us a bit more about some ancient Egyptian gods, how they were worshipped, and what they looked like. Now, me Nui, Aaron. So, now we've landed in ancient Egypt and we've seen some of the incredible creations that they made, but now we want to know who it was that they were trying to impress. We want to meet the ancient Egyptian gods. Here we are. Now, Egyptian gods are a little bit tricky. There were over 2,000 named gods over the Egyptian civilization's 3,000 year existence. So I'm not going to talk about all of them today. Instead, we're going to go through the treasures and tales of a few of my personal favourites. Here we are. So, do you recognise any of them? What do they all have in common? Well, I said that we were going to be talking about their tails, but we're going to flip over and have a look at their heads. As you can see, these gods all have animal heads. Animals were incredibly important to the ancient Egyptians. They were a direct link to the gods. I'd say in Aotearoa, we love our pets and we love our native birds, but the ancient Egyptians took it to a whole new level. If you were an ancient Egyptian god, what animal would you have as your head? Feel free to tell us. Okay. So let's play God Spotting, the Ancient Egyptian Edition. I'm going to describe a god and I'd like you to tell me the number. So first of all, we'll start with the most powerful god, Ra, the sun, sky and creator god. It was said he used to fly through the sky like a hawk carrying the sun. Have you worked it out? Yes, he's there in number two. Although he was the number one ruler of the gods, he would have been like the ancient Greek Zeus or Jupiter or closer to home, probably more like Ranginui. Now, who can see our cat friend, Bastet? I think my pet cat believes that she's a sacred being, but in ancient Egypt, they really were there were serious implications if you were to harm a cat or even a picture of a cat because they were connected with such a popular goddess. Yes, there she is. She's in number one. Well done. 
Now, we need to sniff out Anubis, the god of the dead. Have you spotted him? He's no Dalmatian. <laughs> there he is. You'll see that Anubis appears to have the head of a dog, but with very pointy ears. Does your dog's ears stick up that much? No, in fact, Anubis has the head of a jackal, which is a canine that is only found in Africa. And it has the very cute, very pointy ears. We've nearly done it. But first we need to find Thoth, the ancient Egyptian god of writing, learning, magic, and the moon. Now he has the head of an ibis or what is commonly known to our Australian cousins as a bin chicken. There he is on the right. Well done, Sinopai. Finally, my favorite, last but not least, in the middle, we have Sebek, the crocodile god. It was said that the waters of the Nile were made from his sweat. Obviously, the Nile is full of crocodiles, so it makes sense for Sebek to be such a snappy dresser. All right, now I need you to quickly grab your archaeology hats. We're going to go down into the tombs. We're going to see what happens when you combine a love of animal gods, a love of pets, and a fascination with the afterlife. You get animal mummies. So animal mummies were found throughout Egypt, and the most popular animal mummies were the ones that were the most popular pets. So dogs for Anubis, cats for Bastet, and the Ibis for Thoth. Having a mummy to match the god that you wanted to impress in the afterlife was thought to improve your chances. Otherwise, if you couldn't bear to be parted from your favorite pet, then you could stay together forever and ever. Okay, now we're gonna travel back to the modern day, guys. I'm sorry we have to leave Egypt. We're going to look at how modern technology is revealing more ancient Egyptian secrets than ever. So first I want you to consider, how do we really know what's inside a mummy? Is it the shape? Is it the drawings on the outside? Archaeologists could never know for sure before but now we have MRI scans, a sort of detailed X-ray machine, which show us inside. And we are finding some big surprises. For example, there is a crocodile mummy in Holland. And when they scanned it, they found that it was not a crocodile at all. In fact, it was two young crocodiles and 47 babies, all wrapped up as one in honor of Sebek. At Auckland Museum, we are lucky enough to have our own mummified crocodile, a mummified cat, and our own actual mummy, Tar Sedgment. Having done our own scans, we know that they don't have any more secrets inside, but they still offer us a very real glimpse of what life would have been like in the ancient Egyptian civilization. You can see these online in our collection, or when lockdown lifts, you can have a look for yourself in the museum. So we're still learning the secrets of ancient Egypt and new technology is helping us to reach even further into the past. So we encourage you to keep your eyes of Ra open and explore the treasures and tales of ancient Egypt as much as possible because it is truly fascinating. Now we will get the chance to look at some of the questions that have been flooding in as fast as the River Nile in June and answer them for you in the comments section. Perfect. All right, let's see what we have here. Ooh. There are some amazing questions. Oh, this first one here from Frida. She wants to know, are mummies real? Yes, in fact, they are. Um, we as 
actually Louisa mentioned, we have our own Egyptian mummy who is resting at Auckland Museum. Her name is Tasajmet. She is over 3,000 years old. Um, and we do know a little bit about her. She came from uh, an area of Egypt that is close to uh, the pyramids of Giza that you see there in the photo. Uh, we believe that she came from a town, a city actually called Memphis. Um, and we know that Tasajmet is her name because it's actually engraved in her sarcophagus. So yes, they are real, Frida. Ooh, I have a question. Who was the first Egyptian queen? In fact, her name was Sobek Neferu. So if you remember Sebek, that's the crocodile god. So her name was literally the beauty of the crocodile god. And like Hatshepsut, she would have worn the fake beard and as much as possible had to pretend to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Amazing questions. Ted would like to know how the pyramids were built. Um, so there is some speculation. Um, modern archaeologists have tried to piece that together um, and they do think that perhaps large ramps were used. Um, we now know that the pyramids were actually not built by slaves, they were actually Egyptian workers. Um, but yes, they had to actually haul quite large pieces of stone. Uh, in fact, the Great Pyramid of Giza has, I think it's 2.3 million stones. Uh, each one weighed approximately 2,300 kilograms. Whew, very heavy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have a question. So how did they develop the process of mummification and know that it was going to last forever? Okay, so to mummify something, they would dry it out, either in the sun or with a substance called natron, which is like baking soda and salt, and then they would wrap it up carefully. Now, the idea wasn't necessarily that it would last forever, although it's doing a very good job, but just that it would last sort of enough into the afterlife. So. The fact that they're still here and the fact that the civilization showed that they were still mummified 3,000 years after they started doing it gave them a pretty good idea that what they were doing was the right way to do it. Wow. Yeah, some great ones here. Uh, one here, how many sarcophagus were there in an average pyramid? Well, interestingly, <laughs> one pyramid was essentially for one sarcophagus. Um, so we have various tombs, but each one was for one particular pharaoh. Um, sometimes there would be actually a couple of sarcophagus. It could be the pharaoh um, and maybe some family members like uh, a wife. Um, but yeah, on, on average, it was one sarcophagus per pyramid. Mm -hmm. So Connor would like to know why some pyramids are smaller than others. And does that rank how important the dead people were? Was it only kings and queens that were buried? Well, they were different sizes, somewhat dependent on how they were built originally. So sometimes when they built a pyramid, particularly at the beginning, they'd build it and then it would fall over or they'd build it and it would be bent, which quite a funny thing to imagine after putting in all those 20 years of effort and carrying 2.3 million stones but this the bigger it was the bigger it was meant to impress the gods and um, so yes it was a reflection of how important you were but it wasn't only the kings and queens as Aaron said they would have um people buried with them and sometimes they would have little ushabti which are little dolls and they believed that in the afterlife, they would come to life and you would have little slaves already to help you out wherever you go next. 
Excellent. So we have time for one more question here. Um, Berlin would like to know if babies were mummified. Um, and in fact, yeah, there were lots of different things that were mummified. As Louisa said, uh, sometimes there were animals that were mummified. Um, but the actual process um, was really for anyone. The only thing that you had to keep in mind was how wealthy you were. So the, um, the more well off you were, um, the better the process of actual mummification. Um, so even Tasajmet, for example, at the museum, she wasn't really um, a, a high noble woman. Um, she was probably from a sort of a, a lower middle class, but they could still afford to mummify her. So yeah, there, there are lots of different um, individuals that were mummified as well as animals. So. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid that the clock on our time machine has run out. And yes, we have returned to 21st century Aotearoa. Um, any questions that we haven't had a chance to answer here, uh, we will try and answer later. Um, and we are also going to be putting up some links uh, for different activities for you to do, such as maybe writing your name in the hieroglyphs. Um, so we are going to say farewell. Uh, go ahead and channel the inner power of Thoth. Before we do, though, just next week, Treasures and Tales will be returning, but with a Tadeo special. Um, on behalf of both Louisa and I, it's been a pleasure to have you joining um, us today. Uh, Kakite Ano. Kakite Ano.